All right, everybody, uh, please uh, join me in uh, thanking Natasha, uh, <laughs> who is joining us for the finale of today's event. Uh, please tell us about living complex and interesting and diverse history. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me with them. Thanks for the people who gave the talks earlier. I have, you know, so much to riff off some of the things that Vernita said before me and Ding as well, and lots of things that resonate and echo. Um, I'm going to start by like making a disclaimer first. I am I came the opposite way to biophysics. I started in biology and then made my way to physics. So as a really as a young kid, I was really into wildlife. Um, I was, you know, I used to go bird watching. I used to look at butterflies and learn to identify them and things like that. Um, and that's how I got interested in biology. I got my bachelor's in sort of a molecular biology department, uh, did my master's purely in bioinformatics, realized that sitting in front of a computer all the time wasn't for me. So then I went to an ecology department to start working in animal behavior. I'll go over these things again, but I just want to do a quick whistle stop tour. Um, and only in my postdoc did I really start doing what maybe could be considered mainly biomechanics and possibly maybe slightly biophysics. And that's kind of, again, still where I am in my lab at Western University in London, Ontario right now. So I'm, I want to say that, that I am sort of a deeply political person. Um, so whenever I'm doing something, I'm also trying to understand, you know, what are the larger things going on behind what, what I'm doing? What are um, sort of the theoretical foundations? And I think one of the reasons that I went from being a biologist to being a biophysicist or sort of getting interested in um, physics is I found at least in the way I like my th theory to work, that it had a much more coherent theoretical foundation. And I've also found that this has mirrored my desire to find a theoretical foundation for how I understand the world and the society that we live in. So like in my politics, I'm always still trying to find this exact thing. And I'm going to kind of maybe, especially because I'm only a starting assistant professor, I don't really have a lot of wisdom, but I'm going to tell you what I know. Um, and we can talk about it and you can share yours and I'd love to hear more. Um, so I want to start kind of with the fact that one of the things that I really think very, very hard about is that everybody in this room and many of the people that we meet are survivors, right? Like we're the ones who are left behind. Um, it, it's like that famous picture from the plane. Uh, we're the ones who's who survived these bullet holes. And the things we don't know is what shapes the people who didn't make it, right? Uh, I knew a lot of people in my track here that were really smart, that were really brilliant, that should have made it in science, but they didn't. And to me, it's important to figure out what that is and therefore to kind of prevent that from occurring somewhere down in the future, right? Like what shapes um, what we do, what we think is possible, but also what shapes who gets to do what. And like the thing about asking the question of who is absent in science or in any field um, is it's really difficult to answer about absences, right? There's 7 billion people in the world. Uh, I don't know everybody. That's very difficult to form an image of who's missing. And I think it's also a question that we, we kind of can't in the sort of DEI frameworks that we have, we don't ask it. And I'll tell you one, one very simple way of asking this question. It's okay, there's 7 billion people in the world, maybe eight of the 7 billion people, maybe about two, maybe 3 billion are black or brown, which means every third person you should see or second person you should see should be black or brown, but that's not the case. And there is literally no version of DEI or EDI or whatever that 
that's even trying to achieve something like that. They're just trying to achieve something much smaller. And like, what is, what is that? Um, and, you know, we sort of know all of the factors in this. There's nation states, there's immigration laws, there's geopolitics, there's, source, there's society, there's economics. But like, I want to, I mean, I want to look towards ending all of that, right? Like we want to get to the end of history, but all of those things don't matter and people get to do what they want to and it's fun for them. Um, so that's, that's what I sort of hope for. And I'm trying to, like one way I've tried to form a theory of who's missing is to ask the question of what were the few moments in my trajectory in which I could have gone missing? Like what were the things that were near misses for me? And to me, I had three near misses, I think. Um, I had to escape my family. <laughs> and it's not literally my family, but it's also the notion of what the family is and what the family expects of you. I had to escape society in a certain way. Um, again, society will limit who we are and what we do. And that's one of the other escapes that I had to make in a certain sense. And finally, in academia itself, I had to escape precarity. Right, like it's a th it like people keep talking about the leaky pipeline. That's what the leaky pipeline is. It's it's completely about being a precarious worker, and I want to talk a little bit about all three of these things. And you know, I'll do an imperfect job, but it's it's a conversation I want to start. So I want to start kind of in Bombay, which is where I grew up, and this is this is the first part of my story, which is like escaping the family kind of thing. None of the people on the on the screen are my family, actually. My family, um, I'm gonna like, so to say, my parents are not particularly weird in any way. They're like just completely regular level problematic for Indian parents. They're not more or less, they're completely average in that way. They have, uh, but they are shaped by the society they live in. They are constrained by the society they live in. And asking them to, um, go beyond that kind of could be difficult. So I'll like start with my dad was a huge influence on me. And one of the sort of biggest influences, best memories of my childhood I had from my dad was going to the foundries he used to work in. So he was, he was a metallurgist. And I remember being a kid and walking into a factory when I think Morton Metal was being poured into castings and uh, watching like the way the castings were made, the molds were made, going into his R&D department and looking at how they tested the hardness of castings, how they looked for cracks and it was my first exposure to science. And even to this day, like whenever I look at industrial stuff, I'm just like, more please. Like I'm fascinated by that aspect of mechanics and that's kind of how I am. Then there was my mom and she was a nurse before she got married and she had to stop being a nurse as soon as she was married. Um, and that's because my dad asked her and she always said she was happy to stop being married, uh, to stop working. But whenever she spoke to me, right? Um, whenever she talked about medicine, whenever she talked about biology, you could see that she had a deep enjoyment in being really good at something. And that she didn't have that anymore. She missed it. And when I sort of think about what she did, I was a bit like she was happy to have stopped nursing because she did enjoy the working environment that she was in rather than she didn't want to work anymore, rather than she wanted to be a traditional housewife. And all of this sort of came to a head when I became an adolescent and had to start thinking about like, what am I going to do with my career? Like, what do I want to do in terms of work? And my dad used to say this thing to me. He used to say, you can do whatever you want because one day you'll get married and someone else will have to look after you. It was always a second part that gave me a lot of pause, right? Like, because he was saying, one day you'll get married and someone else will look after you. This is when I realized that in India, where I grew up, um, women are a financial problem. They get passed from a father to a husband and eventually to a son. And they're not expected really to have agency. And uh, 
I was, you know, I just decided I was going to do this thing where I'm going to listen to the first part and work out the second part myself. <laughs> so I went to undergrad in Bombay at the time. And I had so these three people that you see on the screen are three of my professors from my undergrad. And they just kind of exposed me to science and they showed me a lot of different things. And I want to point out, I'm not, I won't like go overly into details, that one of these women had a marriage that she had to leave within a week of being married because she would have been prevented from working. Like, so I had that, you know, role model with me as well at the time. Like, that that could happen to me. Maybe it wouldn't, maybe my dad would support me, maybe my mom would, but I didn't really know and I didn't want to test it. And they showed me that basically maybe science would be a way for me to get out of this. So when I grew up in India, education's free for women or was at the time free for women. So was grad school. So I could apply to grad school and go to grad school without paying for it. I could get a stipend. So once I finished my undergrad, I applied for grad school. I got two offers out of all of the things that I applied for in India. One was in Bombay and the other one was in Bangalore. I said, I'm putting as much distance and as much good finance between me and my family as possible. And I went to Bangalore. And so that's what science was for me, right? Like it was a way of actually escaping financial dependence. And it was fun because uh, lots of people also made that whole escape really fun. And I want to point out like the three people that I worked with that like I did research with when I was in Bangalore. Uh, Professor Nanjandara was my first mentor and he was amazing because he basically listened to everything I had to say and said, study this, study this, study this. And he was dead on every time. Um, he found, you know, helped me learn to program, uh, encouraged all of my crazy ideas. And then I went to Professor Shinivasan's lab and I did my master's with him and I did bioinformatics with him, like all of the computer programming that I'd learned with uh, sort of came into, into play over there. And I did, I had a really fun MSc. I realized I was not good. I was not going to be able to sit in front of a computer the whole time. So I needed some hands-on stuff. And so then I joined Rohini's lab to do a PhD. And there's a whole story there, which is fun, but I know I'm running out of time. So I'm kind of trying to go faster right now and finish it up. So Rohini took me on, we did really fun stuff. Um, and a lot of the things I still think about started in her lab. So I owe her a huge debt, like a huge, huge debt. Um, she was an incredible mentor to have, but I want to say that by the time I did actually finish my PhD, I was exhausted. I almost left science. And the reason I almost left science is I I did not experience what I expected to experience in university. I expected the university to be like this amazing, liberating experience where everybody talked about and thought about science and, you know, we'd have these deep intellectual conversations. No, that wasn't what happened. Um, the university was full of all of the things that are in the world outside. It's not distinct from the world outside. So if there's religiosity in society, it's there in the university. If there's casteism in society, it's there in the university. If there's sexism in society, it's there in the university. And it had horrible effects on the people I knew. I have lost three friends to suicide over the course of my university education, all of whom, you know, were sort of low on the social totem pole and died what were basically deaths by a thousand cuts. It wasn't that somebody came and said, you can't be here, blah, blah, blah. Nothing's ever direct. It's many, many small things. And it added up. And I, I would become political in the uh, in grad school. I had fought against the Hindu right wing in grad school. I'd fought against Hindu supremacy. We won some small battles, but if you look at what's going on in India right now, we lost the basic battle, right? Like it's not, and it's not where it wanted to be. And I sort of realized that science and university weren't necessarily an escape from all of this. So I was getting exhausted and I was gonna sort of quit it all and go become a photographer, a wildlife photographer. But I think in many ways, Rohini knew me better than anyone else in the whole world at the time. And she said, I don't know that she's never said this to me, but I imagine in my head that she knew that it's not any better in 
the wildlife photography universe and that maybe I'd have a happier time outside India where things are a bit different or the kinds of things that bothered me there wouldn't be the same. So she gently guided me into um, into other things. I'm going to, oh, I didn't really have the time to talk about these. I wrote a book while I was at university, a coffee table book with lots of photographs. And I used to catch a lot of snakes, um, which kind of, I caught over a hundred snakes. We used to keep track, but that's weird stuff. Anyway, she connected me to Dana Robert, who was in Bristol. I went off to do my postdoc there and it was different, right? This is why I also sort of said you escape from one society, another one isn't free of problems. They have their own problems, they're different ones, but maybe you feel a little bit easier in them. So I had a really good time in Bristol. We did really fun work. Uh, I got to learn biomechanics, I got to learn biophysics. Sort of for me, theoretically, things were coming together. I felt like I had a background and a foundation for the, the science I was doing. But slowly, what started creeping in was a realization that this postdoc was going to get over. And, uh, you know, this was really fun, but this is going to get over. So, is it so like visa and immigration and going back to India hanging over my head? Um, after Bristol, I got a position for six months in Berlin in this completely amazing place that I highly recommend to anyone who ever wants to take a sabbatical in Wissenschaft Kollegs Berlin. It's a thing where scientists and humanities people work together for a year. So I had an amazing experience there. Next to my apartment was a studio in which Pippa Scottness, one of the artists in my class at Vico, had two full skeletons of giraffes in her studio. And she was writing a book on the bones of those giraffes. So I had like this amazing experience and it was really fun and I highly recommend it. But again, there was this thing hanging in the back of my head. Um, what next? Because I still didn't have a job and I was on the job market by this point. Uh, at this point, I spent nine months unemployed. Uh, and I interviewed for three postdocs. I don't know, maybe an equal or maybe higher number of faculty positions. I went to Australia, I went to the UK, and nothing worked out. So I took one of the postdocs and I came to Canada. And that postdoc was with Andrew Mason and Jerry Pollock. Andrew is this person here, the uh, the person most on the right and Jerry is the person most on the left and I took that postdoc because it seemed like it was the postdoc in which I could have most freedom to do whatever I wanted and it was great it was really fun but I you know there was this still thing still hanging over me and around this time I got my first faculty offer and I'll be I'm trying to be quick I got my first faculty offer and it was in a small Midwestern, no, it was in a decent sized Midwestern university in the US. And my partner, and this is my third long term partner because men don't move with you, uh, said, I don't think you should take it because you won't be happy there. I don't think you should go. And if you do go, I won't go with you. And this was kind of tough, right? Like. It was the hardest decision of my entire life. Uh, but I thought about what he said. I thought it really hard and I thought he was right. I won't be happy there. Because remember what had happened before, what I'd kind of run away from. Uh, so I said, no, I turned down the only faculty offer I'd ever got without anything else in my hand. I asked Andrew, did he have the money to keep me on for a bit longer? And he said, as long as I'm head of department, this position's there, you can stay, we'll figure it out. My partner said to me, look, if nothing else works out, uh, you can." he works as a signal maintenance guy at the Toronto Transit Commission. And he says, you can do my job. So we can both get jobs at the TTC and you can just stay here. And I was like, yeah, you make more than twice what I do, so I'll do that. He works an industrial job and he made twice what I did. So I was like, yeah, okay, I can. 
Um, and that was kind of, okay, let's wait and see. And then eventually this job came along, I applied, I got it. And that's kind of where I am right now. So if I have to sum up everything I've gone through and to say, uh, what is it that I escaped and what is it that allowed me to escape it? Is this, how do we help people survive? What needs surviving? It's about making a living. It's about financial independence. And we have to work on as a community, ensuring that what we offer people who come through the ranks is better money, is better financial support and the ability to become whoever they want to, right? It, and the way we do it is not the way I see it, is not that we give them more information or more, the way we do it is we fight upwards. We fight the people above us that give us grants to up funding for, under, uh, for graduates, undergraduates, postdocs, everyone along the line. We help them find that financial security and we fight for that. So what's my theoretical basis that is for society, bettering society and politics is we need to pay people better. And that's what we keep trying to do in my lab. And I'll stop there. Wow. Wow, thank you so much, Natasha. I'm speechless. That was so impactful. Uh, if anybody wants to unmute and um, share thoughts, questions, please go for it. Uh, I'll jump in. Um, yeah, thank you for that talk. That was that was really incredibly inspiring. I'm I guess curious. You talked about the experience you had in Berlin, where you got to work alongside. Um, as you said, people in the humanities, how did you find that, I guess, experience, like, um, could you maybe elaborate more on what types of experiences or conversations you had with people who were outside the sciences, perhaps, and maybe how that could have also shaped your own research? Yeah, um, it was such a fun time. Um, so there was a group at the same time that I was there who I was probably closest to. There were historians and sociologists and they were working on how we quantitate things and how that affects how we do things. So there were people working on like, you know, how do we write down numbers of mental history uh, and that how that then affects uh, mental sort of further down the line. Um, how we do mental health um, administration. So there were just a lot of conversations about history. I think one of the conversations that really, really strikes me as being important from that time um, is talking to historians about this idea of, bio of geographical or biological determinism and about subjectivity and objectivity in human history. So huge arguments about this and about the idea of sort of extending the kind of modeling we do for animals into humans and sort of not realizing that hu humans are both subject and object of their history. Um, so not they don't just follow the rules that are imposed upon them, they also change the rules and therefore viewing them from the lens of modeling animals is, can be really dangerous because you take away subjectivity from humans when you do that. So that was like a, a big thing that I still continue to think about when I think about that time, but there were many other things. It was just really fun. Yeah, that's really cool. Thank you. Uh, thanks. I will jump in with a question myself. Um, uh, Again, I'm still processing, though so much of what you just said resonates. Um, so, 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 you know, the theme through the talk was that of being banished and disenfranchised. And so I guess the, the, the flip side is how do you find community or do you create community? And how do you, how do you suggest to your mentees that they find community? And, a space for themselves where they can bring their organic 
authentic whole selves to work? Yeah, I, you know, I, I do want to say like, um, there were always people who helped me escape. Whenever I said I escaped, when it was uh, escaping sort of this, it, it really, there wasn't any, anything, nothing happened in Bombay that I really needed to escape. It was, I had to escape the feeling that something may happen, the threat of something happening. Uh, but it was people in Bombay that helped me get out of it, right? Like they showed me what was available to me and what the opportunities were. In the same way, Rohini was in the milieu in Bangalore and she showed me what was there beyond what was there at that place. So the people, there are always people who know more than you and can show you things beyond that. I think to an extent, you have to let people help you. Wow, on that very powerful note, thank you so much again. Uh, and thank you indeed to all of you who have made today so powerful. I'm closing the recording on that note.